Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today again for an Empower Tactical podcast. Uh, today, we have Sifu Eric Oram on the other line. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm well, Damien. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. So it's, it's again, it's a great honor to have you today on the show. Um, we've been doing this podcast for Empower Tactical mainly um, just to empower people. You know, it's been, it's been a quite a crazy time. People going through a very tough um, mental state of mind, I guess, just to rebuild themselves or to even think that it is, whether it's possible or not, you know? I mean, we've yep. got a very, quite big extended wintering family and I had different people coming onto the podcast, which was a great support for them as well, wintering or not wintering Kung Fu. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. And if people don't know, this is how, how we met. And uh, today, the, the, one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the show is, I mean, People know you for your great contribution to the art, obviously, for what you've done in Hollywood and everything that you've done as a fighting choreographer. There's so much um, to say about you in terms of how good of a person you are, I've met you in person. And uh, I think there's so much that you can contribute to people in general, whether they're martial artists or not, on how they can be self-motivated. Because I think it is very important to look after yourself first before you look after others. So. Yes. For those that don't know who you are, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about you, sir? Uh, well, I am a lifelong martial artist. Uh, I started martial arts when I was 10. Uh, I just a couple of days ago turned 52. Um, Happy belated birthday. Thank you. And likewise. The October birthdays. Uh, yeah. Um, so it, it's getting increasingly harder and harder to remember a time where martial arts has not been a part of my life. Um, I'm also a musician, I'm a drummer. Um, oh, wow. I was also trained, uh, starting to seem like a long time ago now, but um, I was trained as an actor, as a uh, film and fight choreographer, and have also directed plays a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Oh, wow. um, and I do a bit of writing as well. That's amazing. Um, and and I've, I've seen a few things. You, you've wrote a couple of books as well. Is that, is that right? Uh, I've written one book, yes. One book. Uh, a couple of articles. A bunch of articles. A bunch uh, of articles. Inside Kung Fu, uh, Black Belt, uh, Karate Kung Fu Illustrated, uh, Sports Illustrated, oh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I did a, quite a bit of writing in the various martial arts magazines, yes. That's amazing. A drama as well. That's great. Yes, sir. <laughs> I wish you could bring my guitar. It's very important for martial arts, as I, I know. And uh, I remember when we went to Hong Kong, we went to the karaoke bar, and I'm like, oh, my God. Good martial artist. You can take it anywhere. <laughs> it's good, good memories. I, I didn't claim I was a very good vocalist. <laughs> well, anyone can claim that. Once you get into a karaoke bar, everyone thinks they can sing, you know? <laughs> so... <laughs> It's one of the good things. Uh, that's amazing. So um, so you mentioned, obviously, you started and you've been trained to do um, fighting choreography as well. Is that, yeah. Has that had anything to do with your martial arts skill at the time? Or did you, is that something that you thought this is what you wanted to do? Well, um, I definitely, I, I was studying acting at the time. And I had a, a film and stage combat instructor come through the university at UNLV where I got my undergrad. And it, to me, it was sort of the, the in-between of acting and martial arts. It was sort of the bridge between the two. And between uh, some of my early mentors in that realm of things, I, I started to see the fight choreography as being a physical dialogue between the two characters, if the, if the fights are any good. Um, I'm not a big fan of action for action's sake. Uh, I like a good story. My dad was a huge film buff when I grew grew up. He had a library uh, back when, you know, the, the, I remember the day Betamaxes came out. Oh, wow. So, uh, again, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> and my dad quickly built up a, a film library when, and I was a young teenager, I had, I had several thousand movies that I could go into the den and pick off the shelf and 
my dad would sit me down and say, all right, you know, you're going to watch this actor and here's his great movies. And this is why he's a great actor. And here's this great director. You're going to watch his movies. And this is why he's a great director, et cetera. Um, mm. And he introduced me to Ender the Dragon when I was pretty young. And that's motivated me to even begin learning martial arts was because of film. So in that blend of Bruce was a real martial artist and yet, he was doing, you know, they weren't real fights or choreographed sequences. So there was that interesting blend to me of these two characters coming into conflict. And if, to me, if the scenes are any good, you can, you can absorb the story of the fight and how that conflict has become physical. Absolutely. And then like physical dialogue and there's an objective, there's obstacles and you're, hopefully the story is being flushed out through the action sequence. The character traits are being flushed out through the action sequences. So I, I try pretty hard to carry that, that mindset into anything that I have been thrown in the past sequences that I've been involved in. And how does, how does the action drive the story and what does the action reveal about the character? That's amazing. It's obviously, you mentioned this and you obviously have been doing so many action movies done um, since then and um, choreographing all the, the stunts and you obviously been a great part of Robert and his movie. And uh, I was going to talk about um, the Sherlock Holmes movies. Did you have a lot of input? Because that when you say, when you're explaining what you had in terms of involvement and what you want to see on the character and you can see that the fight scene is completely different because when you look at the fight scene, you can see the story uh, behind um, all the fights that's happening and it stands out a lot and you saying this right now um, did you have yeah. a lot of uh, input into that uh, what, what the I fight scene has to be about I did I that's why Robert and I've been training Robert since 2003 um, he's now become kind of one of my longest students um, continuous students and after having some conversation we both agreed that the Wing Chun was not just what he did and what he knew um, and what he credits for a, a very large amount of his recovery, but he felt it was right for the character because of its engineering, the, the science behind the effectiveness of the system and particular the, the lineage that he was a part of. And one of the bit of resistance that we got from the the production company was well uh first of all we wanted to our objective was was to building off of experiences that i'd had in the past where i've had to change the system in order to accommodate angles or story or um one thing i got yelled at by more than one cinematographer in the past was, you know, slow down kid. We can't see what you're doing. It's not reading on camera. It's too fast. It's too fast. So, and yet we, we, Robert and I had this objective that we were trying to hold on to on how can we be pure to the system and not change it. And yet not just ignore the reality of, of that because uh, they, they were very concerned that it's going to, it's going to be too, it's, things are going to happen too quick. And that was certainly my mindset. I didn't want these unrealistic, you know, fight scenes that just go on and on and on and on and on. And nobody ever seems to, you know, you know, to they get, get whacked up and then they get up and, you know, off they go to the next adventure. And yeah. to me, that just didn't ring true. And we wanted to bring a grittiness and a realism to those sequences that also felt right for the period. It felt right for uh, Guy Ritchie, the director's uh, that kind of gritty style that he brought to the table as well. And I thought the the system, uh, the, the tone, the period, it, it all seemed to be coming together. And yet there was a lot of concern that we were going to, it was all going to happen too fast and we were going to leave the audience behind. So after brainstorming a little bit, we came up with the idea that, well, what if we used, you know, I, I said, well, Sherlock Holmes is a detective. He's perceptive. He reads all these little 
you know, ideas of, you know, you know, just by the look in your eye or the speck on your shirt or whatever, he comes up with all these, you know, he enters it in and he spits out this data as to, you know, what you had for breakfast that, that morning and, you know, your, your day's itinerary based on the minimal clues. So why would he not apply that same level of scrutiny intelligence to sizing up an opponent? And knowing, okay, this is what this guy's strengths are. This are his weaknesses. This is what he's going to do. And this is how I'm going to exploit it. So Robert jumped all over that. And he, you know, we looked at some of the key moments of the sequence and he used that to, to flush out the dialogue that he wrote for it. Um, that was not scripted. That was something Amazing. that we had come up with and then he took and ran with it and basically worked out the dialogue himself and then brought it back to the, the scene. So the idea was we wanted to get inside his head, get an idea again, character and how character drives the story. And by doing that, we acclimated the audience to what was gonna happen. So then when we cut back and went to it real time, it didn't seem too, fa too fast. Too fast, yes, because obviously so, you could see what was happening. in Right, so the audience was. told, this is what we're gonna do, and then we did it, and he pulled it off. And I thought, you know, and that was the, that particular scene, the bare knuckle fight from the first Sherlock. Oh, that's exactly what I was thinking right now. <laughs> fight scene that Robert had ever done on film. Wow, that was amazing. That was really good. So, yeah, he, he he uh, a after that, most of the rest of the sequences were a lot easier by comparison for him. Yeah, from like the little cloth, the little white towel. I love it. <laughs> it's great. And that was, uh, again, all the the little things. Uh, we we were talking about how you know, he's going to like, you know, throw a bilgey in the guy's eyes and then use that to bridge the gap. And it's and they're like, no, 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 it's too fast, it's too brutal or whatever. And um, the, the gal had set the handkerchief down on the side. Yeah. So we came up with the idea, well, okay, well, if you, again here, we, it's too fast. And, that, and to be fair, that wasn't something that we had put in the previous. Uh, the, the sort of, you know, the, when he goes into- the concept the on how to see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's, it's amazing. Uh, but I was going to say, though, because obviously everyone knows now that Robert has been through so much in his life and obviously Wintering has helped him a lot in terms of the art. And he's been obviously a great actor um, for every last recent movie that he's done, which is amazing. And, and the reason I wanted you to be there today, uh, because not only you have contributed in terms of the art, but you had this vision way before that movie. That movie was a door of opportunity that knocked you knocked down to be able to apply the concept. Like you mentioned before, when you were at Union, you were studying and you had this vision that action scene is too many movies. And, you know, when you look at the fight scene, it goes on forever or it doesn't make any sense. Sometimes people just fight for no reason, just for the sake of showing their skills of martial arts, which is not bad because it inspires martial arts. I'm like, oh my God, I want to be able to kick like this guy. I want to be able to do a flying kick. I want to be able to do punches like this. But there's no real story behind this or no... Like you say, people just keep punching for no reason. How many times can you get knocked down in the head? You know, it doesn't make sense. Um, and that's great. So how long between that study of what you wanted to change in terms of bringing your, your concept of, of fighting choreography to the day that you've done that movie? How, how long has it been since uh, in between? Uh, I don't know, 15 years. <laughs> 15 years. Wow. Okay. Wow. 15 years. So, you know, I was talking to some great martial artists as well as pe successful people it doesn't have to do with martial arts and now uh, i think business enterprises and it doesn't matter how many times you fell in life or how many times you try and talking about the strong mindset of the martial artists what got you to wait for 15 years for that to happen a combination of i guess experience and opportunity um when i first began in film i got my sag card back in uh, my Screen Actors Guild uh, membership back in 1989 was my first official film. And, you know, I, I, I was green. I didn't, you know, I'm, it's, I'm brand new to it. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to please. And so if I'm doing something and I, I think, okay, 
this is what I would do in this situation. So I do it and they say, okay, well, it's not reading for camera. It's too, it's too fast. So, oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I would just try to come up with ways to accommodate the agenda. And I feel like as I got older, my tolerance for certain types of compromises got less and less and less. And by the time it came to Sherlock, uh, quite frankly, I, I originally turned down the job. I, I, I turned down the offer uh, for a variety of reasons at the time uh, between my, my school that I was running and my family. And I had two young kids and you know how I, how I was gonna leave my school, leave my family, go to the UK and Let's disappear see. into a, a movie for six months. So I, I didn't see how that was gonna work. So I was sort of of that mindset where, well, if I'm gonna do it, then there's certain conditions that it's gotta be worth it for me to disrupt my life to go do this. You know, it's, it's all mm -hmm. smoke and mirrors and make believe. So yeah. um, that was sort of part of the, the paradigm going in is we're, we're going to bend them to us and not the other way around. Uh, of course, it didn't always work that way. Once <laughs> we, bullets started flying, you know, you say, okay, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. But Exactly. exactly. Um, and, and it was uh, a series of very difficult experiences. Uh, I won't pretend that that was uh, uh, an easy project to do. Um, in fact, I can't think of a single film that I was involved in where I thought, oh, oh, that, that went that was easy. exactly the way we planned. And that was fun. Um, mm -hmm. They're all a battle um, from day one to the, t the, to the day we're done. But by the time that one came around, I had enough experience, uh, I think, under my belt to where I knew, at least to a degree uh, at the time, how to pick and choose my battles and what was worth fighting for. And quite frankly, what was worth getting fired over. There was a little, there was a time period where about every day I would show up and I would tell the, uh, the, the, the other, you know, the guys on the stunt team, I said, I think today's the day I'm going to go guys. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's sunny. You know, there was so much pushback on so many different levels on every square inch of real estate as you're being, a, you know, creatively, uh, attacked on a daily wow. basis and challenged and challenged and challenged because every, everybody's got their own self-interest in mind and nobody, you know, there's the egos and then it, it's a business and there's a lot of money at stake. So the producers want to, you know, make sure so everything every is single choice is, was highly, highly scrutinized and fair enough. I mean, and I, I there were no allusions to that, but you know, I, I wanted to make sure that at least we had a fighting chance going in to accomplish our goals before I uprooted my life and had to put on my my flak jacket and my hard hat again and go over yeah. and start taking the blows, you know. That's it, and you know this is this is what it's all about. I mean, uh, I mean, the reason we do this empower tactical program, and I mean, I wasn't never thought I was going to do podcasts before. To be honest with you, I started doing a live seminar for Black Belt Magazine. I think I mentioned this to you um, mm -hmm. during this pandemic because we're still in lockdown in Melbourne at the moment, which is crazy. Um, California so, is not far behind you, my friend. Um, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So quite frankly, the, the, what, what's inspiring in that message that you say, because people keep thinking, oh, my God, I've been, I and mean, you've mentioned 15 years. I mean, I mean, for some people, it's not a long time because they've got so many years ahead that they want to be, they're still young and they're thinking 15 years, I can do this. And some people think 15 years, no way. I can't even do six months being in lockdown. But just to take that leap of faith, and, you know, like you said, you had obstacles. It's all about life choices and how you deal with the consequences after that. You know, you made a life choice to think you knew there was two people on one side of your shoulder or you leave your family and disrupt your school and things that you've put in place for so many years that was working for you and take that leap of faith and go to the UK and make something happen that you dreamt since you did that acting classes and obviously the things that you wanted to put in concept because obviously yes there was a conditions in the terms that will suit you but at the same time there was something that you made happen and you thought about it 15 years prior to that which is amazing and you did it and you should be proud of yourself you know um 
And I think all the techniques and uh, that Robert executed are in front of the camera. And uh, it's the thing that you thought about and for 15 years, you know, it didn't happen just on the day that Sherlock Holmes was made and so many movies and aspects that you've done. And I think it's something to be really proud of. And, and, and I wanted to mention this because obviously people should think and whoever is listening right now, that whether you're martial artist or father or not, it doesn't mean because you can't do it today that you will never be able to do it, you know? I mean, I've, I've spoke to, um, to Bay, uh, Bay Logan the other day and, and he mentioned about something when it doesn't matter how many times someone try to be successful and how much sacrifice they put in their life in keep trying and achieving something that they really want. You, you know, I don't know many people that fell to that because you keep trying. I mean, it's all about how much input and how much sacrifices and experience that you add into the process of achieving the things that you really want. But once you put your mind to it, you can achieve anything, you know, especially when you become a father, you would know that sometimes you feel like failing. There's a few people watching little ones um, looking up to you. And if you want to be right. proud, it's, it's, it, this is what homeschooling is about. I mean, for me personally, being a father, I think homeschooling is not about doing the maths work and all the other, um, subject that they had to fill up at school because we had that for so long here but it's about being a role model and i believe every instructor whether they like it or not have the duty of care to be a role model because when he's standing up in front of a class or your father or your teacher you have people who remember your names i mean if i mean i'm sure you've been teaching so many people around the world and i and i doubt i mean if you can today that'd be amazing but i can't remember the students name Sometimes I walk up in the street and it's like, hey, hello, Sifu, or hello, Damon. I'm like, I don't even know who they are. Because one day in my life, I interacted with that person and they remember my name because I was the only one standing at the front. And you changed so many people's life. And you may not know about this. I mean, people don't really know, but you're not really on social media. And uh, I think I sent you something the other day. And I said, oh my God, look at you. You're appearing on this article in this magazine. And it's amazing on how by projecting the experience that you had in your life, that you have in, in still inspired so many people. I mean, the Winchering community get inspired by you for everything that you've done to, to um, promote the art and the things that you've explained and talking about BLG, some people are like, what is he talking about? Putting his fingers like this, you know? And most of the other community will know that you're talking about um, the form of Winchering, which is amazing. So well done. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well done. You know, I, I was with our teacher from, since 1983, so wow. the, starting when I was 14 years old, and that the training, I, I literally grew up with it, and it has obviously had a huge impact on my life, and I continue to, to train and teach to this day, and I'm currently teaching my own kids, and I feel very strongly that regardless of whatever other creative or you know whatever endeavors I, I may or may not do business wise that I will always keep two feet squarely in the training process um, not because it just benefits me personally but I feel like that's a uh, I've been teaching co-teaching since I was 16 assistant instructing since I was 16 teaching professionally wow. since I was 17 and I've Learned a few things, I think, over the years on, you know, how to take this sort of abstract concept and communicate to people in a meaningful way that they can not just understand it, but more importantly, they can do it. And through the process of doing it, empower themselves. And Absolutely. watching people wake up to their own power potential, to me, I, I get goosebumps talking about it. I just, it's, I get an... There's an energy that I enjoy when you see somebody turn on to themselves and uh, wake up to a new version of how they perceive who they are and what they're capable of doing. And I enjoy that. I enjoy giving back. And I feel like that's a service that I can provide. And no matter what else I may or may not do, I want to continue doing that as long as I absolutely positively can. That's great. Uh, well, I can feel that, you know, I mean, it's, this is very empowering to say this and, and now because all of what you do is not so much you want to achieve what you wanted to do for yourself 
And the fact that you want to give back, but you also want to make sure as an instructor, I think it is very important that when you give back, it's not so much to give back to be proud of yourself, but to be give back to make whoever you instructing a better version of themselves. Because it's all about them to discover their own life story. And all you can do is to guide them with your own ability and being genuine about it. And it's very important. I think it's it's amazing. It's great. I mean, we need more yep. guys like this, you know. We need guys and girls, obviously. If Emma was on the call today, she would like talk about women. <laughs> we can do this too. Um tell but, by one. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um what I was going to ask though, because I've seen I've seen a video, and again, it's probably been YouTube for a while ago, that you were doing some fight choreography for, I think there was a young kid or a teenager who came in and you had a little crew and you were replicating the, the, the fight scenes. I think it was Sherlock Holmes yeah. and yeah. to make them feel great about themselves that they can do it. Is that, was it just a one-off or did you just kept doing that? Uh, that particular thing was just for that event at the time. Okay. Okay. Well, that's great. But it's I, really good. I absolutely, you know, the producers approached me about doing it. Um, I didn't get paid anything or whatever. They just told me what the setup was. And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm in anything that's I can do to help. And that's great. The, the kid was great and his energy was great. And we had fun. That was, that was fun. That was fun. I mean, uh, I mean, you should keep doing that. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, the, the thing is you have so much talent and skill acquired for the years and I mean, you're doing obviously an amazing job with Robert and everyone that you've been involved to. I mean, people didn't know, but you were also an actor in Captain Marvel. Is that right? Or Captain America? One of the God? Uh, I was not an actor. I was involved with the fight crew. The fight crew, that's right. Yep. Okay. But w there was one of the movies that you want, You were one of the God. Was that right? Oh, uh, you're probably talking about Iron Man 3. Iron Man 3, that's right. Yes. Okay. They're trying to spot you everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I played uh, one of the guards in a, the basement sequence where Robert, uh, he only is able to retrieve, Tony Stark is only able to retrieve uh, one glove and one boot. And creating that, and I, I was the primary choreographer on that film. And that scene in particular was a lot of fun. And we had choreographed it just because of the erratic nature of it. It's making mistakes and he doesn't have all his tech so he has to kind of make do and because he only has one glove on one side and one boot on the other side so his balance is off and everything's you know he's having to figure out how to use this tech while he's fighting for his life and th those are the kinds of things that story-wise I'm, I'm kind of drawn to it's a, again character and story um but we had finished the sequence uh how we'd sort of capped it off on how we were gonna end it. And then we started riffing off on ideas. And then one idea was I was gonna play uh, the, the sort of super villains that take, that, you know, they have the red eyes and yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, can have, you know, these super soldiers. I was gonna play, he, he wipes out all the guards and he thinks he's done. And the idea was that, you know, he goes to leave and then down at the end of the hall, we see one more guard with the glowing red eyes and that was supposed to be me. And then I come down the tunnel and I, I come after him sort of like uh, the film Inception where they have, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a great film if you haven't. It's a wonderful sequence to it where in the dream, kind of dream sequence where they're having the fight in that rotating hallway. And so we were a little bit inspired from little, little inspiration there with the sort of kind of being able to have these guys go up off the ceiling and along up the walls. And meanwhile, while I'm coming at him from one direction, Tony's pieces of his armor are coming in one by one by one and attaching. So as we fight, this stuff is coming in and it, I, I was starting to get pretty excited about the sequence and then um, Marvel kind of stepped in, well, no, 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 no. This is getting too, expensive. <laughs> getting too expensive, we can't do this. So they scrapped the whole sequence. And then they decided there was a, a Robert felt like the, the scene still needed a little bit of a button. And so the director, Shane Black, turned to me and he said, well, you were supposed to be in the scene anyway. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, so let, let's get you in as, 
as one more guard and we'll, we'll come up with something. And um, it just won't be this big drawn out fight and you won't be one of the extremist guards. You're gonna just be a regular guard and we'll come up with something. And as it turns out, I didn't know what that something was until the day we shot it. Um, really? And oh, wow. Literally the moment that we shot it. So I, I'm in costume in the hair and makeup and the suit and the whole thing. And I literally have no idea what I'm going to do. The, I'm on the soundstage waiting. Uh, everybody starts showing up and cameras are setting up and I still have no clue. Nobody's handing me sides or anything. So I don't know, know what oh. my dog is going to be or anything. Oh my and God. In, and he hands me a stack of uh, five, three by five cards. And he said, so Sifu, here's your, here's our top five choices of what you're going to say. We're going to run through all five of them uh, back to back to back to back to back to back. Whenever you're ready, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I figured I'm, I'm not going to memorize every version you know, I said, so let's just do this one at a time. I'll take a card up and we'll go out. So I would say the, the, the opening line or two, and then Robert imp would improv off that back to me, up on, standing up on the balcony above me. And then I would improv back off of his improv. <laughs> and we did different versions of that. And no two takes were the same. Um, so we burned through all the, the cards with the, the camera was above and the coverage was down on me. And then we went to turn the camera around. Now it's behind me and it's the coverage is now up on Robert on the balcony. And they're like, okay, let's, let's go. And I'm like, well, go what? I mean, we just go did away, what are you doing? <laughs> 25 different versions and variations off those different versions. So which variation are we going to, it was uh, a bit. Wow. Wow. It's, it's, well, it was it's almost, oh, the folk, it squeezes you into the, a place of focus. And again, the martial arts training is, you know, you, you feel like you're just, you're under fire, you're under fire and you go to that place that you have to go in order to find your center in the middle of the hurricane. That's just this, this swirl of craziness. And I have to put all of that out of my mind to just focus on, all right, this is what we're doing right now, right it's now, good. right now, and just do that. And it's when we finally got through the whole thing, I was, as soon as they said, all right, the last take was done and cut and we got it, that's it, it's a wrap, I was gone. I, I just <laughs> shot right out of the soundstage and Robert came running after me. He's like, no, 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 you got to come up and watch. I said, I don't want to see any of it. I'm done. I want to go home. I want to get on my paddleboard and I want to get one last night before I have to go back to LA. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, no, you got to see it. You got to see it. So he drags me back up to the video village they had set up on top and they're running the takes back and all the producers were cracking up. And um, <laughs> they, they tell me to this day that, that the, the, the line that I spat out was, was the, got the biggest laugh in oh. the theaters and, oh and with the, the live audiences. Um, it was I, interesting too, the, the, the writer, he even uh, had mentioned in an interview a while back when they were talking, what's your favorite line from the movie? And he said, my favorite line was actually improv by our, our fight coordinator, Sifu Eric Orem, um, in the scene with Robert, which I just, I, I don't know. I find that very funny. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to find this. <laughs> Literally one line, you know, it all came down to one little line in, in the thing and it was done, but it, we went through all of that to get to the one line. To one and line. The but that's, it was fun. Um, we had a good that's, time. <laughs> that's great. Uh, it, it's funny you say this because because um, out of what you've said, I'm talking about that one line. What happens before that one line is, I refer to it as the journey to, this, to success. You know, we spend so much time collecting stones and we left the diamonds behind, like one of these signs, you know, you, you you work so hard and you don't appreciate the journey and you think that the day that you're going to succeed to that goal, it's going to be amazing. But most of the time, I think 95%, maybe I'm wrong, uh, of the time when you put a goal to mind and you work so hard for it, once you get there, you don't feel any different. I mean, you feel pride that you have achieved it. And that's why people keep setting goals and goals and things that they want to achieve in their life. Because if you only put one, I mean, it's not satisfactory enough compared to the journey to get there. I mean, I enjoyed the story of what you told me most of learning the fact that 
people say, oh my God, Sifu Eric Aram is just the stone fighting choreographer for um, Robert Downey, or he's a close friend and he's helped to do this. But the story and the journey and the mindset and, and how I believe that martial arts mindset with the blueprint, if we use that in life, you can be anywhere. You mentioned about focusing on one point, it's focusing about problems. We talk about this pandemic, people focus about the problem, like, oh my God, six months at home, what am I going to do? Well, there's so many things you can do. Go study, go train, improve yourself. You know, if you focus on the problem, yeah. you know, you focus on the problem, you, you're just going to find problem. Yeah? But if you yeah. focus on the solution, even if it's one, it helps you to improve yourself to be a better version of yourself. I mean, I believe that anyone can be self-motivated at anything that they want to do. I mean, if you decide to sit on the couch, you decide to do that. You decide to get up. It's your choice. It's all about the life choices that you make and how you deal with it. And it's very important to know that no matter what you do in life, whether you're in Marvel, whether you're on the street, whether you're a cook or chef, um, having a blueprint, I believe martial arts because I've done it all my life, having the blueprint of martial arts helps you in anything that you do. And it helps you to be a father. It helps you to be a husband. It helps you to be a brother. It helps you to be anything in life. And, and Absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's, it's amazing. It's incredible stories. I mean, how, how many, what, what other fun stories do you have at all the fight scenes that you've been part of, or the movies that you've done? I mean, you've done also a movie, Chloe and Fear. I think I've seen you one. At least you didn't have to put any hair. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I had a, a student of mine that was, a, he's a film director and a writer. And... I, I can't even remember quite how that whole thing unfolded, but it all happened really quick. Um, they sent me not even the full script, but just my sides, uh, my, my lines of dialogue, which of course all changed when I got there anyway. Uh, <laughs> I had about, if I remember right, I had about four or five days from the time that I got my sides to the time that I was on a plane. And then I'm, uh, I think I, yeah, they flew me in that morning and I went straight to the film set. Wow. And then we ended up shooting those sequences over the course of a couple of really, really long days. And the lead actor was an actual Inuit from, I don't remember the exact region now. Um, I'd have to think about it, but way up north. Um, Look cool. Really interesting character. Um, so it, and the movie was the movie and um we had some some interesting experiences getting through that it was a real grind but what i really enjoyed was in between the takes just being a sitting there and absorbing his knowledge his wisdom his perspective um because the whole idea was that you know he had come down from the and again I, I the exact region it's not Alaska but it's more, much more north of that um, upper regions of Canada but he he came down to basically bestow this wisdom of you know the the West is sort of not living their life the way they should and he needs to talk to our elders to have this communion elder to elder to like correct us and how you know you know, you, you need to change your ways because, of course, you know, what you're doing is taking you over here. And as a physical, spiritual, real human being, life, we need to be going this way. So he, he made this mission to come down and, and, and communicate this. And his personal belief system as an actual Inuit was very, that was completely parallel to the character, which is wow. what they had built the story around in the first place. So I just, I, could, I couldn't get enough of just listening to him and his wisdom and his life perspective and the, and, and granted in some ways their way of life was also quite brutal, which was interesting to hear how they, we, we would see certain aspects, you know, on the surface of being very brutal, but how they, they interpret that in a very, very different way. And, in a, and, and it turns out in many ways, a very spiritual perspective. I just really, really enjoyed the, the time that I spent hanging out with them. That's great. Well, you learn different perspective in different type of field, movie, world, of part of the world that you travel to. And it's and an incredible. Experience. Type of... 
I'm sorry to interrupt. Just as an experience too, that was another one where I was just dropped in. You know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I had no time to develop the character. So we kind of just dropped in and off we went. And uh, I think there was some shoulda, woulda, couldas, uh, you know, some things that we probably could have done better had, I, I know we could have done better had we had more time. But again, sort of the, we're going back to the falling back on the martial arts training and experience and not letting the, all the uncertainty and the, the fear of what was going on and just saying, all right, I got to center, I got to focus and just take, look in his eyes and take this That's one right. line at a time That's or right. look in her eyes and Dakota and just take it one line at a time, one moment at a time, one moment at a time, absorb the direction. Let's do the next take one take at a time, one step at a time and not let the mind spiral off and, you know, get, too caught up in how old you, you know you're you're dropped in front uh time is money the clock is ticking there's a cast and the rest of the cast the rest of the crew they're all sitting around and you know okay uh this is take four take five come on kid get it right and you know we we, we want to get out of here and so you and i have a sense of pride and it was my friend and student who was the director so i wanted to honor that and get it right and I believed in the message of the film and wanted to, to be able to do my part and have them pull me up to it and not have me drag them down. Of course. Because uh, all the rest of the cast were very, very experienced actors. So I, I definitely felt like the white belt jumping into a black belt <laughs> bar match and had to figure out, you know, how to accl acclimate and, mm -hmm. and try to keep up. That's it. Well, you did it again. Martial arts blueprint, which is amazing. But um, have you you've done other martial arts as well before? Have you? I have. I've, I've read somewhere that you've done a bit of um, kickboxing as well, or different type. A of little bit. Um, I started off in uh, a branch of Ed Parker's Kempo Karate back okay. in. Bay when I was a kid, did that for four years before jumping ship and began studying Wing Chun under Grandmaster William Chung. Okay. Um, I studied a little bit of kickboxing, a little bit of Jeet Kune Do, uh, some freestyle grappling, a um, little bit of Muay Thai. And I underline a little bit, I am not professing to be an expert in any of these other martial arts, but, um, especially during a, a certain time period of about, about a 20 year time period, I was on one hand, really, I, I see the results, saw the results of what I was already studying and we train it and use it and it works, it works, it works, it works in the street, in sparring, in challenge matches. And yet there's always that little bit of the counter in the brain where, you know, I didn't want to get caught up in that trap of just thinking because I'm doing it, it's by definition, the best system. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I'm aware and okay, well, you know, just, I, I kept, I kept coming to, and I, I sparred a lot of some pretty damn good Muay Thai fighters. And I wanted to learn more about that art. Um, came in contact with some Jeet Kune Do guys. And so I wanted to know more about that. And uh, as grappling got uh, back in the very early days of the UFC, which uh, our teacher at one point was trying to actually get us into, and I guess we got screened out, but the uh, knowing the sort of the popularity on the rise of grappling. And I started encountering in sparring situations more and more grapplers and I figured all right well uh so far I've stayed on my feet but sooner or later you know chances are I'm going to have a bad day and somebody's going to get a hold of me and if I go to the ground I want to have a more confidence in how to how do the principles continue uh in transition from being upright while I'm going down to when I hit the ground to how to transition from being on the ground back to on my feet and so I felt like I needed to go through that process and have enough experience to where, and I'm not, again, I'm not professing to be 
an expert grappler, but I feel like I got pretty good at beating someone off me that's trying to take me to the ground. How And if I did get taken to the ground, how to get back up onto my feet and get back to my system. System, that's amazing. It's important. I think, I truly believe that, um, of, of course, we don't want to say it as an instructor to an expert in the field, but it's important to understand different type of martial arts before you go out and say, hey, yeah. this is what you're going to do if a boxer punch you without knowing on how a boxer is going to punch. I mean, it's important to understand your enemies, you know, um, before you say this is what would work and what wouldn't, you know. And like you said, it's referring to your fight scenes. I mean, you had to see different type of action scenes for you to know, okay, this is what I can improve and I can put my input and change it and to make it a better way for viewers to feel the story behind the, the punch. And I guess if you didn't see that, you wouldn't know what you could change or what you could improve. You would have gone just read that one line that you were saying about that movie that you did. Um, and I think it's important and that's great. It's, it's, and you've also, I believe, did a few of the actors in, and did some fighting choreography for a few of the actors like Christian Bell as well, is that right? A little bit. Um, yeah. Christian came to me to help him prepare for his first Batman movie. Okay. And we had, we got some momentum going. And then in the midst of that, and the plan was, uh, I believe, I believe the plan was to uh, continue we were going to train for a certain amount of time period and I forget now what it was, a couple months, whatever it was, and then go over with them to the UK and continue and go from there, which the implication was that we would then begin to integrate. We would plug in with the fight team because it was a British crew and we'd plug into what they were doing and begin to integrate what we had been training and blend that into the fight sequences. And unlike Sherlock, I was right from the very beginning was trying to take things from the system that I felt could fit the clear direction that Christian wanted to go. So I wasn't trying to, you know, have pure Wing Chun, but draw on Some certain concepts, certain techniques, certain principles, um, however it, it fit the story, but not force it to, to, to do that. what it shows, yeah. And then uh, unfortunately, Christian's father had passed away, so he ended up oh. having to go over to the UK early and everything kind of just uh, broke apart and I ended up not going over and the British guys took over and did a fantastic job. Yeah. But uh, I did tr train Christian a little bit to help him get him going. And uh, apparently he did use some of what we worked on and integrated that into what he did with the guys overseas. That's amazing. Well, it's, it's obviously whether it happens or not that you want on the scene and, and doing all this, it, it, it's good for you as a learning curve on how to, to adapt to different people and different actors. And I guess it was a good uh, contribution for yourself to have your input and to know how you can work. And like you said, there's always room for improvement and you only can learn by improving yourself and by trying and experience has contributed to that, which is amazing. It's great. And even as, uh, with the choreography aside, as I know, you know, even for just from the instructional perspective, every student's different. Every student learns differently. So having to constantly adapt, the system is the system is the system, but how I communicate that was different to Robert versus how I communicated it to Christian versus how I communicate it to other, well, in this case, actors that, you know, especially if time is really short, I have, you know, a, minimum amount of time to all right they come in and we work on something for an hour and then they go away and then i may or may never see them again so what am i going to choose from the toolbox to decide to use that day for that time and then how to figure out how to communicate it to that individual and try to suss out in the first you know five minutes how this person learns, what their strengths are, uh, and try to appeal to that. 
which is very different than if we have a student that starts from day one and you know, at least in concept, that the student is gonna be with you day after day after day after day, and you can build them up and build those skills on a step-by-step, layer-by-layer basis. So Absolutely. I've come to, at first, you know, and Robert will sometimes, he'll, he'll just bring, show up and bring people into the training sessions. And, uh, you know, okay, I guess I'm training this person today. So I have to do this instant recalculation in my brain of my lesson plan, because now what I had planned for Robert is going to leave this person in the dust. And yet I also want to make sure that he gets his, Trends you know, well. workout in or whatever. And then now I have to assess this person and see their character, their attitude, their energy, their coordination, uh, their level of respect, et cetera, so and feel that out and then kind of recal re recalibrate what the lesson plan is going to be and then go through that and then try to, of course, make it seem like of, uh, that's what I just showed up with. And, <laughs> and I enjoy those. I, I've come to enjoy those challenges as a teacher. It keeps me on my toes. It's, uh, it's amazing. And, and, and it's great that you mentioned this because uh, everyone can grade or be, how would I put this in a nice way? I mean, everyone can become an instructor or a teacher for school, but it takes someone um, very particular to be a great teacher. And, and, and again, it goes back to on how you help the individual that will come to you, you know? And I think not many instructors or teachers has that ability to be able to pass on the message or pass on the education. And mm -hmm. I think it's very important. I think, and it's something that you said on, it's funny because I, honestly, I wanted you on the show because I believe that you have a great ability of skill set. Um, and I think people need to know about this. And it's important that you have your contribution, that you have obviously um, worked so hard to be able to put it out there for people. And you're very humble. You know, you want to say, I did this or I contributed to that. But I know. And I think it's important for people to know that you have contributed through hard, your hard work and failures and sweat and uh, maybe tears of the things that you had to do to be who you are today. And teaching is very important because I believe when you're teaching, and I've, I think I've mentioned this to you, I wanted to challenge myself and including Emma who helped me who does the fitness. We wanted to go out there and teach people with all abilities, whether they have um, Down syndrome or different term of illness that doesn't yeah. allow them to train. I believe that anyone can learn martial arts such as anyone can do anything they put their mind to it. And, yep. But the skills to be able to switch instantly when someone just walked in, like you said, Robert came in and was like, hey, see if I've got someone who want to join in the class today. You know instantly every good teacher would know that, yes, you want to please the other person to make sure they come back. It's like, oh, my God, I felt like I've learned something today for their own ability. But at the same time, you want to make sure, and that's a great teacher, that the other party, whoever joining, who, 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 who brought in the other person, felt like they've learned something too. And, you know, and it's not easy yep. to be able to split a class with two different levels, two different understanding of what they want to get out of it. And that's, for me, that's a great teacher and it's amazing. And that's great. I remember when I was a kid, I was at school, I hated accounting because I thought, geez, the guy, when he walked into the class, the only thing that he was doing, he was eating a carrot. And I thought, Everyone was making fun of him. And, and you know, it was always cool and it was funny. I mean, we would just have lunch and we're about to study accounting. And this guy just walked into the class every day with a carrot. And I thought, come on, man, it's silly. Boys school, what are you going to do? They're going to pick on you. And I was really bad because the reason I was really bad because I didn't pay attention. I wanted to go play basketball, do boxing in, instead of studying in the classes. And my mom's like, you don't pass this subject. With a nay, I'm gonna kick you out and you're gonna stop everything. I thought, holy oh, shit, I gotta get my head to it and I gotta focus. And uh, one day this teacher pulled me out. He's like, hey, I'm just eating a carrot. How much is, uh, what's missing? I said, the piece that you ate, obviously. And he took the time. I remember that day. He took his time and he said to me, I'm gonna explain this to you. Every time I'm eating a carrot, the crumbs that's coming up is depreciation. And he was going this analogy and explaining to me, on how you can put that into your, you know, accounting theories. And I thought, oh my God, 
This mm-hmm. guy just enlightened me while I was making fun of him with his carrot. It's crazy. And he changed my life. And I loved it. You know, I love accounting now just because he took his time and he has changed my life in teaching because I believe everyone that comes into you, whether they come in or not, has the ability to learn. But you just you just need to have that light bulb in their mind thinking, I have to whether get them excited, showing them some flashy stuff or get them excited to make them believe that they can do it because it's all good to show people you can do something. But you need also to make them believe that they can do it. And you have also the great ability to do so. And it's amazing. I, I mean, think it's, uh, it's, and it's an ongoing process. It's not like I, I sit here saying, you know, I've, I've got it all figured out. <laughs> of um, course. You know, know like, like martial arts, like mastery, I feel very strongly that it's a process, not a product. And it never stops. The learning never stops. And no, it doesn't. I, just keep I, I seem to have a knack for perpetually putting myself in positions of you know having to kind of biting off more than I can chew taking on new things dropping into these kind of crazy situations and having to get orientated and and you know figure it out and go and I, I had a couple of very good mentors that early on, uh, Nar- Sifu being one of them, you know, the, the ego, you know, the system doesn't care. Yeah. It doesn't care. So either I'm getting punched in the face or I'm not. So how I feel about that makes zero difference to the system. So it's my job to simply make sure I don't get that fist in my face. And that was particularly important for me as a teenager at that time, at that place with my circumstances and whatever, because it would have been really easy for me to get caught up in what was going on around me. And a lot of it was not good and not healthy. And the, the focus, the discipline, the respect that it forced upon me um, is difficult, as excruciating as it was uh, for most of that time period uh, and beyond. But in particular, as a you know young teenager, you think you know you think you know everything, and you know it's a, you of course you know, <laughs> you're not going to listen to authority, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, I definitely needed that in my life, and having that sort of grasp in the process then that's being reinforced by my drum teacher and that's being reinforced by my acting coach and my directing mentor so i'm getting pounded over here pounded over there and finally my ego went okay 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 (laughs) (laughs) i'm out i'm out and you know i get it it's a process it's a process it's a process which was extremely liberating because once the ego lets go, and I'm not saying I have no ego, but I'd like to think I have a constructive ego, a healthy ego. I take pride in my work, um, but a willingness to learn, uh, keeping an open mind, constantly putting myself in a position of being a beginner. Um, I started writing, creative writing uh, 25 years ago, and it's just now kind of, quote unquote, uh, starting to pay off. Yeah. Um, just uh, scuba diving. Uh, I just went up with some Top Gun fighter pilot instructors the other day and, uh, and they, they kicked my ass uh, <laughs> at 5,000 feet. Um, uh, learned to ride a motorcycle for the first time in my life. You know, after when I was growing up as a kid, you know, I, I grew up at the edge of the desert and a lot of the other kids had motorbikes. We had horses. Um, so they were always just kind of like foreign entity, entity to me and everybody, all the kids were getting just racked, you know, broken collarbones and broken oh legs, and, you know, and most of them didn't even have helmets in those days. Yeah. And so to me, motorcycles was always sort of this like scary taboo and, I don't know, my son, his age and his interest, and it just 
circumstances aligned. I thought, you know what, I, I want to learn how to ride a motorcycle. So, you know, here we are, you know, out in the desert with my son, you know, going trail riding and just it's amazing whatever, just examples, whatever it might be, uh, scuba diving, paddle boarding, um, just things that little light bulbs go off and say, yeah, that that's going to take me outside of my comfort zone. That'll be good for me. Uh, that'll take me outside of my comfort zone. That'll take me out. Acting was a, a big part of that. Um, I don't really consider myself, quite frankly, that that good of an actor. But I think going through that process was really good for me. It absolutely forces you to you you got to literally step outside of yourself and own this other character and you can't do that you can't embody this other person unless you let yourself go and you can't creatively get to the place where you find that character if your ego's holding on step by step and which as a 18 year old 19 year old i was desperately trying to do you know i didn't want to make an ass out of myself in front of you know, a thousand people out on stage and yeah. going into it with that mentality resulted in me making an ass out of myself in front of a thousand people so okay right so this is it's no different than martial arts you got to leave the ego at the door you have to have that willingness to learn and mistakes are how we learn and that to me was one of the the biggest gems that got pounded into me during that time period and it's never left me so i i i kind of start to seek out the things that kind of put me outside of my comfort zone and just when you start to feel like you got some kind of a, a groove going inevitably i'm putting myself in front of something that shakes me up a little bit and has to you know put the chip put the ego at the door and nothing about this situation and i'm surrounded by some of the best people in the world that are with this thing and okay so just because i may know something about something over here doesn't make doesn't guarantee that it transfers over here so again clean slate open mind white belt day one That's show it. me what i got to do all right how, how does this work let's go and all right i screwed like that up okay well, note to self don't do that don't do that okay and that's how we begin to narrow down what what do we do that's great it's uh that's very very true sir and uh like we say uh life starts on the other side of your comfort zone you know once you get of that you feel great like you said about motorcycles i mean how long did that take you and your son and you did something amazing with your kid that you thought you wouldn't be able to do because you were always scared of getting hurt yeah i kind of had this uh literally as far back as I can remember I think we moved into that house when I was what in the second grade I okay. think so whatever I was five six years old no a little older than that seven or eight uh, whatever it was so you know since I was since I was a young kid and again it was like one of those things where I, I don't want to I, I don't want to have a fear about that you know if it ever turns out that it, I, I need to jump on a motorcycle I want to be able to get on it and know what I'm doing and not absolutely this thing. And I, I, I feel like fighting to me was like that as a kid, because I got picked on a lot when I was young and fighting was literally, you know, a nerve wracking concept for me. And anytime conflict would, would happen and it happened a lot, I seemed to be a magnet for it. I was kind of a quiet kid. I kind of kept to myself and for whatever reason life would just you know make a point of going okay uh you yeah we're <laughs> messing with you yeah well. and i flipped my lid uh out of pure fear i completely went off on a few kids that had tried to jump me at one point and turns out i ended up hurting them all really really bad but i didn't remember any of it i completely blacked out and I kind of come to as my friends pulling me off and I'm pounding this kids into the face into the pavement and I'm like, Oh, well, what's, what's he, and it literally scared the hell out of me. And by learning martial arts, I feel like it demystified physical confrontation. 
So there's only so many ways that somebody can throw a punch at you. There's only so many ways somebody can try to grab you and take you to the ground. There's only so many ways somebody can kick you or punch you or shove you or whatever it is. And after being punched and swept and kicked and whatever, and my <laughs> wrenched out of my socket and choked out, blah, 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 and having, you know, bones broken. or what. So there's kind of not much left that someone can do to me. So yeah. it's sort of demystified this whole thing. So some of these other experiences by put, by going through these really difficult setups, so much else in life just feels so much easier by comparison, you know, de dealing with difficult people uh, and there's no shortage of them in the film industry. Um, some of these producers that I've had to navigate through, you know, <laughs> sitting there like screaming at me or whatever i'm getting it back into it with them you know, it's, you know God damn it. that's exactly what, you know and then we walk away and somebody go oh my god i can't believe you spoke to him like that i'm like he's not trying to hit me you know exactly. not, there's a movie it's all make believe it's all bullshit and you know there was a, a point we were trying to make and that line was being challenged so we we held our line and there was a reason for that so you, you break it down to what it is and not be caught up in sort of the yeah, mental yeah. imaginings of you know like for me when I was a kid physical confrontation your, your my fear the brain immediately goes to the absolute worst case scenario I'm going to end up you know with my skull cracked open in the hospital or what, whatever the deal was so by breaking it down and demystifying it getting to know it getting inside of it it took that fear away and that helped me learn everything is like that. So sure. life problems are Wing Chun problems, martial arts problems, and martial arts problems are life problems. They're interchangeable. The process is the same. So I come up with a challenging situation, something that you know, kind of go, oh God, how am I going to, okay, it's just like everything else. Let's get inside this. Let's break it down. Let's, let's step by step what's what are the steps let's break it down and take the steps break it down take the steps nothing is different it's all the same it's just a matter of detail what is it uh practical hand gunning is it uh you know physical combat is it acting is it choreographing uh the creative writing process being a father being a teacher blah 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 being trying to be a good friend and human being Break it down, take the steps, break it down, take the steps and having the patience and the discipline to to follow through with it as uh, exactly. obviously none, none of this happens overnight. No, it doesn't. It takes a lot of um, experience and a lot of um, I'm going to say this. I mean, it takes a lot for you to be who you are today and you had to go through this. And I wouldn't obviously people wouldn't look at someone who's bright and very enthusiastic and obviously know what they want to think that this person once was bullied before. You know, I mean, I was bullied when I was at school. People wouldn't think that. And uh, like I said, no one knows what you have, what you've been through until you tell your story. And I believe everyone's got their own story, but I believe the story doesn't end there. This is just a chapter part of your life. And you keep going, like you said, white belt mentality. You just keep learning. It's a learning curve, a learning process, and you just keep embracing what comes to you and you just narrow it down to one point and you focus on that point and you just keep going. Absolutely. Line. I feel like this whole, you know, this year, 2020 has been one of those extreme type of circumstances. You know, okay, you have a certain type of groove going along and then something external comes along and just smashes your paradigm of what you think your life is about and what your life is going to be. And not just myself personally, it's affected um, on, a, on a personal level, my starting with my, my kids and my, my wife and my fam, my extended family and um, not to mention the whole entire rest of the world I know. And you say, okay, well, here we go again. Um, we have a situation that seems at first glance really overwhelming and in many ways very disturbing and how to find a center how to bring it in breathe relax focus let's break this down let's break it down and take the steps what can we do and do that and exactly. every single day 
get up in the morning and have to do that mental reset. Today's a new day. Yesterday is past. Tomorrow hasn't happened yet. All we got is right here, right now. And how can we make the most of this today? One day at a time. Words of wisdom. So true. One day at a time. Yes, sir. Count. It's so true. It's amazing. What do you have to say? What's next for you? What's, uh, what's, what's next on that? Obviously, if we have a normal 2021, what's on the card? Uh, there's uh, another film project that keeps threatening to happen, um, which if it does finally happen, this will be the fourth time that this movie will have supposed to have gone and gotten up onto its feet. Um, creatively, this is sort of the one that I've been chomping at the bit to do for a really long time now. Okay. Um, 2012, so eight eight years. Wow. Been waiting to do this one. Kind of right. getting pushed, keeps getting pushed, keeps getting pushed, and then with because of COVID, got pushed again. Um, I'm also doing a, a couple of writing projects, but one main writing project at the moment, and okay. which again is, I'd kind of been working on it anyway and soft developing it. Um, this one, the original idea I had of this uh, started 20 years ago, and now is finally turned into something that may actually have some life to it. We'll see. It's a very complicated, very difficult, very ridiculous process. But again, in the spirit of, well, what can I do? So, um, and the family is pretty much at home. So the, that my life, my home life has, you know, the, the sort of moment by moment demands of the day that's, that's changed a lot. Um, okay. uh, so we're around a lot more. So trying to be more accessible and uh, we're, we're training and we've been playing music. My, my kids are musicians as well. And every week we have, we have our family jams and um, <laughs> it's been awesome watching my kids come to life musically. And my daughter, you know, is just beautiful vocalist and pianist. And my son's been learning guitar and he's starting to come into his own. It's been great to see and you know i'm sitting there behind a kit and jamming along and i'm looking over my daughter's nailing it my son doing his thing and i'm like it's the best (laughs) it's the best it's the best um, nothing can make it any better you know and i say well uh, in in the gaps i'm training i'm teaching you say okay well if i can't teach in person then i'm gonna teach online and we have gone and we tried to adapt and make the this two-dimensional format you know every day i try to figure out ways to make this sort of unnatural format as dynamic as we can possibly make it uh in terms of energy building reflexes even not just technique um long story short and i decided to that i wanted to take the time to get into the take the writing more seriously and get dig deeper into that and again talk about white belt man I feel like I'm, it, is there something below white belt? <laughs> I don't think there is. <laughs> We've had the belt. Maybe we should take it off. Yeah. And then you think, you okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm a blue belt now. No, I'm still <laughs> white. He's still, uh, he's still white. The, the higher level of talent that I work with, the more I realize I don't know. And again, it's been a, a, a daily exercise in getting my creative ass kicked. And, you know, as soon as I start to get stirred up about it, I put myself back in check and say, no, this is part of the process. It's part of the process. Just because I don't like, you know, hearing that what I just submitted, just because they don't like it, no, shut up, let the ego go, absorb the note, try to understand the meaning behind the criticism. And 10 times out of 10, they're right, I'm wrong, and I needed to fold my understanding of things into you know bring it up to a higher level bring it up to a higher level bring it up to a higher level and this is exactly like being as a as a teenager when i'm having to spar my seeings my seniors and who are just world-class martial artists and my teacher and you know every day i get my ass handed to me so if you look at it from a certain perspective you know my mom would say 
well, how'd it go today? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I got my ass kicked again. So what am I supposed to say? It went great, you know? But I look back on that time period and I think, thank God, thank God I went through that. Thank God they, abs they, they broke the ego down into where there's absolutely nothing left. And out of that empty void, that's where I started to grow as a human being. Absolutely. And so I feel like come full circle here I am, you know, 40 years later and I'm getting my ass kicked on a daily basis. And now there's that place that I can automatically go to put that self in check and just absorb the note and do it, absorb the note and do it, absorb the note and do it. And then you start seeing the results and and in a way, yeah, I care about the results because ultimately the results have to be there or nothing will happen. Absolutely. Same time, it's been uh, creatively satisfying and reinforcing that on a daily basis, I show up at the beginning of every session with that feeling like, okay, I'm about to be pushed over another cliff without a parachute. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to do. And at the end of the day, there's an expectation of result. So you just, you, do it. Yeah, I said, you just okay, here, we're on the cliff again, <laughs> you know, and off we go. And you just have to trust that you're going to find your way and we'll make mistakes and we're going to fuck it up. And I don't know if I can and say it's, that. It's okay. <clears> and it's up. normal. <laughs> and it's normal it's That's, normal to do yes and mistakes are how we learn and we just got to get going and start going through the process to start digging things up and making choices and if it's not the right choice we'll figure that out we'll hit a wall we'll you know and one way or another we'll find our way and if we don't well tomorrow's another day and we'll jump off the cliff again and we'll do it all over again until we do find our way absolutely and, uh, under this particular gun for one year solid now. And I, I still don't quite know where the light at the end of the tunnel is, although I might, might see a little twinkle <laughs> of light happening. Yes. But we, we, it just, we uh, again, just the, the process is the process is the process. And I, I kind of enjoy, I think at the end of the day, the things that keep me on my toes. It's great. It's amazing. I mean, we really hope to, to all see the light at the end of the tunnel. And as you mentioned before, enjoying the journey and, and embracing the good things that you have and being grateful for what you have surrounding you is more important. Um, I, oh, well, it, it's as well as important as the results of the process of what you want to achieve, but it's important to enjoy every single day and just to be happy and just to focus on one thing and enjoy it, you know? It's been amazing Absolutely. to have you. And Thank you so I much. Oh, it's my pleasure, because I think uh, just to cap the point that you just made is that and like using what I'm doing now as an example, there's no guarantee that what I'm going to do or, or any of like the creative projects that I've done before in the past that have gone nowhere, uh, a couple of them right to the brink and oh, okay, yeah, and then nothing, nothing, nothing. So I've gone through that so many times that I have no illusions that this is going to be any different. But I feel like, again, going through the process of this is in and of itself enough. So even if this thing doesn't ever see the light of day, I'm okay with that. Because Absolutely. what am I doing on a daily basis? I'm, I'm keeping myself engaged in this process because at this point, quite frankly, the the martial arts, as far as a learning curve, that learning curve, it's not that it's, it's flattened out, but it's not as steep as it was when I was a teenager or in my twenties or even in my thirties. So it's something newer that keeps me in check in the same way. And I enjoy that process because I feel like it keeps me grounded. It keeps me real. And by getting yourself chewed up and spit out every single day, there's no room for the ego. And I feel like that, that process is really, really healthy. And if you don't enjoy it and you can't in learn to enjoy the process of making mistakes and learning from those mistakes, and you're only chasing doing what you're doing for the, the purpose of that result, then I, at least for me personally, I feel like 
that that's when I, I check out in my heart. And if my yeah. heart's not in it, and if I'm not engaged and I, I'm not fund, even if it's difficult and challenging and sometimes maddening, but there's a part of that process that I'm still fundamentally enjoying. And at the end of the day, it's like, that was awesome. Let's, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. That's again, it's all about enjoying the process and celebrating. I believe it's very important to celebrate every single milestone you've got through the day, whether it was bad to have an argument about a line of what you think you have the reason to argue for. You've got through that. It's a little celebration that will get you that bigger result, what you're looking for, but it's enjoying the process. And it's very important because if you don't, you're going to spend days going back and forth and thinking, oh my God, there's so many mistakes happening. There's so many fallbacks. And all you think is complaining and all you will be doing is complaining. And that's what people need. People need to know that to be successful in life, success is not about achieving what you want, but it's also to believe in yourself and take a step back and say, hey, I came this far because where I was, the, the, what you thought you were going to do five years ago, you've made it. Or if you didn't, you still moved on and achieved a lot of things within that period of time that you look back to. And it's important to sit down and look back. You know, everyone set some goals and one think of tomorrow. I mean, I'm sure this year, everyone sat down for a minute and said, when is this light going to happen? What's going to happen after COVID, you know? Um, and I think it's very important to have that strong mindset and being happy of where you are because if you're not it's no point and embrace Just, the, the positive sides of what have come out of this um the I, I definitely feel like i have bonded with my my family in a way that the the circumstances were just so different and i i feel like i've always had a pretty good relationship with my kids but this is you know, with the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything is heightened. Everything's more because we're around each other more. And it's so I it's been feel amazing. like let, let's embrace that. And okay, if we're going to be around each other more, what? Let's learn more from that. Let's do more with that. Let's let's come out of this. Well, assuming that we'll be coming out of this, <laughs> out of this stronger than when we stepped into it, one way or the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a great pleasure. I really look My pleasure, forward to, to see all the great things happening for you and uh, keep shining. And thank you again for the Winching community to um, keep the word out there that, you know, there's great instructor lifting up the spirit of the art and providing all these great informations and knowledge to the world in Hollywood. Thank you, I sir. Do my best. Thank you, man. Appreciate thank it. You. You're welcome. <laughs>